Hi, I'm Steve Shaw of Intel, and I'm going to be talking about best practice benchmarking. So evaluating MariaDB performance on premise and in the cloud. So what I'll be looking at is initially some of the questions you should ask yourself before you start benchmarking. Then we'll have a look at an enterprise level benchmarking tool called HammerDB. We'll look at some of the, the, the workloads, so a simple walkthrough and then example comparison. So a benchmark for comparing different systems. In this case, CPUs will be comparing some Intel processors gen to gen. We'll have a look at some advanced benchmarking, some cloud performance, and then finally some next steps on community contribution. So let's start with the uh, benchmarking considerations. So what sort of questions should you ask before you actually start to run some database benchmarks? Because quite often people will jump in, they'll run some benchmarks without having really considered what they actually want to measure and whether the workload is the right one to be able to get the, the insights in what you're looking to compare. So just an example, you know, are you looking to compare different database hardware and gain insights about that from your benchmark? Or maybe you're looking to compare different aspects of database software or the difference between, say, different software releases. You know, perhaps you want to look at cloud services and measure, say, the I.O. capabilities of one cloud service against another. And also then you have aspects such as regression testing of code changes. Or you might even want to be doing stress testing and see at what point when you want to vary a load when something will break. So overall, I encourage you to think of this on in terms of a, a benchmarking spectrum. So at one end, you know, we have very much the, the faster, cheaper, more generic workloads. But what you shouldn't do is then run some of these very simple workloads and then try and assume insights about something that the workload doesn't fully test. So for example, some running something very simple and drawing conclusions about the hardware, the software, you know, the cloud services, the whole range from something that doesn't really give you that full level of insight. On the other end, again, this is also a common error that somebody will assume that you need to run the most complex, high cost, you know, almost like a full production you know, in some full production workload to try and get you the insights about one single, you know, application, which can have high levels of cost involved, but then is not necessarily transferable. So a real key question you need to ask yourself is, what are you really trying to prove from running these benchmarks before you start? Of course, when we're looking at MariaDB, you know, we can't really talk about benchmarking without talking about Sysbench. You know, clearly it's on the, the faster, sort of the, you know, the cheaper end of the workloads. You know, it's, it's very simple to run, but also gives the advantage of having both, you know, generic and very transferable workloads. So you can run Sysbench anywhere. The downsides are that the schema, you know, is quite clearly very basic and the query is a very basic. So you might not necessarily be getting insights into, say, the locking and latching performance of the database software. Also, because you're running a lot of single queries, there's a very high CPU utilization from the round trip. And as CPUs, we get more cores, they get faster, then unfortunately the benchmark is spending more and more time in the round trip and less time in the database. Now, overall, in terms of the applicability, you know, the question you have to ask going back to the considerations, is this a workload profile which is very similar to something you want to run in production? If so, then it's absolutely perfect for you. However, you know, as we see in the graphic there, if we're looking to make an enterprise database comparison, you know, perhaps we should be looking for a workload that will actually run on all of these databases to then be able to give us a, a better insight. This is where HammerDB comes in. So HammerDB is an enterprise, you know, and cloud database benchmarking tool. So from the name, it's the, the leading relational database ben benchmarking tool. It's open source. We'll mention so it's GitHub, you know, it's on GitHub. It's on a GPL v3 license. It's got contributions from a large number of CSPs. 
And it's also hosted by the TPC Council, so the Transaction Processing Council, who's the industry standard body for database benchmarks. So the TPC OSS subcommittee oversees all the changes that goes into this particular benchmark across all of the databases it supports. There's binary releases available on Linux and Windows, but you can test databases on any platform. So not just on those platforms, you can run your clients on Linux or Windows and test any database running on any platform. So what databases does it support? You know, as we can see from this graphic on DB engines, we can see rapid growth in the popularity of MariaDB. Unfortunately, HammerDB supports all of these most popular relational databases. So this is the way that you can get comparable results from one tool, but then used to compare and contrast across multiple different database, database software. So you can then take MariaDB you know, across the, the, this growth and use it then com to compare across running different data, enterprise databases. Also, in terms of the, the workloads, HammerDB supports two distinct workloads. So on one side, we have tProxy, which is OLTP, so a transactional workload. This is, you know, as you would expect, you know, it's read-write, high throughput, deliberately introduces contention into the database. So it deliberately encourages, you know, contention in terms of locking and latching. On the other hand, it also supports a workload called TProc H, which is your analytic decision support type workload. So you would use this, for example, for testing the MariaDB column store. As it says, both of these, so for OLTP, this is derived from the TPCC specification from the TPC, and the TProc H is derived from the TPCH specification. It's worth noting, though, that the, uh, the because these are derived workloads, it's not actually permitted to use TPCC or TPCH in any non-fully audited benchmark because this is a trademark violation. It's also worth noting as well that we have you know, in-planning and HTAP workloads so very much combine the two. So to be able to combine both the transactional and the analytic on the, the same database, that is called TPROCH, which is in planning, and hopefully that will be developed in sometime in 2022 for release. Now, one thing we have to look before we start you know, benchmark is considering you know, some of the, the key concepts when we're comparing tools. So, and arguably the most important key concept is when you have a benchmarking tool, you want that to be able to run in parallel. So you want the, the benchmarking software to be able to create multiple threads or virtual users as we turn them and have them running completely in parallel. So when you have a client with multiple cores, we want all of these virtual users running completely independently. So that means the concurrency control is taking place within the database. So we're testing the locking and latching within the database and not introducing artificial bottlenecks by having the concurrency control within the benchmarking client. This is something you know, that will enable us then to cross-reference workloads you know, across multiple database engines. And when we do this comparing and contrasting, across different database engines, then it can give us high confidence levels of the sort of throughput that HammerDB can give us right across the, the overall range. So we can see what the overall throughput potential of a system would be. Also with the programming languages of HammerDB, it's been designed from the ground up for high performance and scalability. So as you would expect, all the database commands or in SQL, you know, the interface is, uses the MariaDB connector in C, and the application logic is in store procedures intentionally, so we're not spending all that time in the round trip time. And we can see this just by looking at the CPU utilization, we can actually see with 68 threads, the Sysbench has about 7x the system CPU utilization of HammerDB. And that's the main reason for that is because of all of the additional time we're spending in the round trip rather than actually spending the time testing the database. HammerDB uses 
T Tickle or TCL as a, a glue language intentionally for this parallelism. So that is the reason why this language was chosen. So if we compare it to other languages such as Python or Lua, they have the limitation of a GIL or a global interpreter lock. So what that means is we're doing the concurrency control in the client and not so much in the database. And that means we've introduced serialization essentially within the benchmarking client. That's not something we want to do. So we really want the parallelism to take place within the benchmarking client. So then we're testing the concurrency control within the database. We can use coroutines when we're using event-driven scaling, and that's something that we'll refer to later. So we're using coroutines appropriately for when the workload needs it. Another important concept is the, the one of cached versus scaled benchmarks. And this is very much where we fit you know, on the benchmarking considerations and that overall spectrum of faster, cheaper, you know, more generic insights against the more complex, more in-depth and more expensive workloads to run. So with a cached based workload, essentially what we're looking to do is stress components such as the CPU, have most of the data cached within memory, you know, within the, the buffer pool, and then we're going to have the, the log buffer essentially, and the, the redo log disk is the highest component of the IO. So once we've ramped up and we're running the workload, we're not going to really have that much IO to the data area. When we move more towards scaled benchmarks, what we're actually going to do then is introduce a lot more data into the workload. So we're going to have very many, a lot more warehouses, which is the basic construct of the, the TPROC-C workload. We're going to introduce thousands of sessions, probably have middleware as well, but then we're going to be running something much closer to a production workload. Again, it depends on what component you're actually looking to test, depending on what's appropriate, whether it's a cached or a scale benchmark. By default, most people tend to run the cached workloads for the fastest and quickest insights. So let's have a, a walkthrough now of a TProxy workload for one of these cached workloads before we look at an example of comparing different CPUs from gen to gen. So HammerDB has interfaces, it has a graphical interface for Windows and Linux. It also has a, a command line and a REST HTTP interface. There's full compatibility, so it's exactly the same code that runs underneath all of these different interfaces. But what we'll use just in, in this example, we'll take the, the walkthrough using the GUI and then we'll show the example using the command line to show how each different one works. So the first thing we want to do is define is to, to build a schema. So what we need to do is select those schema options. So as you can see, most of them should hopefully be fairly familiar. So we're going to choose a storage engine. We're going to choose like the, the, the connection the options that we have. And then the schema bill will create the tables load the data, create the indexes and store procedures. And then it will create a defined number of warehouses. It will create, once it's created the stored procedures, it will gather the statistics and produce a final build schema ready for us to start running, running a test. From all of those options, probably the most important one or the, the, the most common question is how many warehouses do I create? So from the default cached workload, it's important to note that a virtual user will choose a home warehouse at random from the number of warehouses that you create. And then 90% of the workload is going to be satisfied from this home warehouse. And that is regardless of the number of overall warehouses that you create. So in this example, we've got two virtual users. So they will do 90% of the workload on two warehouses. So whether you create 10, 1,000 or 10,000, you're still going to see similar results because it's based on the number of virtual users within this default mode running 90% of the workload on this home, home warehouse. So it's an important consideration. You should really think of how many virtual users should am I planning to run? You know, and you should base that, for example, on the number of 
the number of cores and the number of the sockets in the server that you're testing and create enough warehouses so you don't expect contention from the maximum point that you're going to be able to run. You can create larger amounts, and we'll talk about that later you know, for, for features such as event-driven scaling. So if you have a look at the, the schema build, once we've chosen the option, it, it's very much a, a one click. So you create, it will create virtual users for you, and then it will run. It depends on overall the number of CPU cores that you have because it's creating the data for you at the same time as it loads and also the overall IO throughputs on, on the database. Once it's complete, you'll see the message that the scheme has been created. You have the store procedures, the statistics, and then we're ready to go and head to start testing. An alternative, you know, especially if you're running in the cloud, we have this alternative data gen option where you can just generate and produce the flat files for uploading into the cloud, and then you can build your own, own schema based on the, the, the data that has been pre-generated. Once we've created the schema, and then we're going to have a look at the driver script option. So again, we have similar sort of connection options. There's a, a test-based driver script. This is really just to make sure that the schema build was correct, you know, your environment, everything can connect, and you're not going to start running workloads with, with errors. So this will show you the output from the virtual users. When you're comparing systems, probably the most important thing you want to run is the timed script. So this is a measured test. You're going to give it some ramp up time. So this is where we're going to load the data in memory. Then we're going to have a test duration. So a period of time, we're going to time the overall throughput and report out the, the metrics for that individual test. We also have some advanced options, which we'll discuss later. And then when you click OK, it will load a driver script based on the number of options that you've chosen. Then we click Start to run. We can start running the test, and this will run the transaction mix in our schema. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be calling that TProxy workload, which is based on the TPCC specification. We're going to have a transaction mix based on the number of new orders, payments, store procedures mostly, but also as we see their delivery stop level and order status. So we're mixing very much read writes, and then some more complex read only queries. So we're really going to test the concurrency within the database. And we're really going to put you know, the emphasis on how well the database can manage the overall locking and latching between the different sessions. The, the output will show you the, the status of the virtual users. So in this example, you know, the virtual users are running, and I'll show you when it's complete. And if you want to stop the test, you can just press the stop button to terminate the virtual users. When it's complete, as you can see, we get a, a, a result. So it will tell us the, the overall result in terms of new orders per minute and transactions per minute. So we get two metrics, which I'll explain later. You also have the option to, while the test is running, to view the overall level of the transactions. So we can see in this example, we saw slightly increasing level of transactions over the test. And there's also a CPU metrics as well. So we can see you know, the, the amount of user and system utilization as we're running the actual test. So what does the output actually, actually, how can we interpret this output when it tells us we get NOPM and TPM? So the important concept here is really to think of NOPM is how fast we're going. So this is the metric you're going to use to draw comparisons. And this is the different is this is the, the metric where we can compare different databases. So this is the, the key one that we use for the test. And it's close relation to the official TPMC without being, of course, the official TP, TPMC metric. So NOPM exactly as it would suggest, is describing the number of new order transactions per minute. So just the new orders only out of that transactions that we do over that period of time. So in this example, 689,000 know, new orders per, per minute over that entire averaged over that period of the test. 
In terms of the transaction per minute, this is your database related metric. So this is something you can't compare from MariaDB to other databases, but this really shows you how hard the overall database engine is, is working. And this example, we're running at just over 2 million MariaDB transactions per minute, which is the handler commits and the handler rollbacks metric taken from out of the database. So now we've done a, a walkthrough, we've seen how the test works. Let's have a look at an actual comparison. So we're going to compare system to system. I'm going to do that on two different Intel systems, the, the current Ice Lake generation and the previous Cascade Lake generation. As we mentioned before, we have full scripting Go language support. So this is exactly the same workload as we ran previously, except within a command line except now we've run a, a for loop. So you can see we're running the same workload, but we're going to increase the number of virtual users over time. So then we can just start it running, leave it for three hours and come back and capture and analyze the, the log output. So we've run this test. Overall, this is an example of the sort of executive performance summary that we would give. So this is very much the, the high level insights that we've got from running this workload. So on these systems, we can compare both generations have 28 cores and 56 threads. And we can see that the Ice Lake, so the Xeon Gold, so the 6348 has delivered 1.2x, so 20% higher throughput than the, the previous generation, which is the Cascade Lake system. We also have the insight, and we'll show where this comes from in a moment. The P95 response times are 0.77x on the Ice Lake system compared against the Cascade Lake system. So overall, you know, for exactly the same number of cores, we're getting 20% better throughput, and we're seeing an improved customer experience from faster response times. But looking just behind this sort of overall executive performance summary, you know, this is some of the insights that we can get from generating a performance profile. So moving left to right on the x-axis, x axis, when we have that for loop, what we can see now is each data point is that individual test. So we've captured the average throughput, in this case, over a five-minute period of time. We've then increased the number of virtual users, and we've plotted these data points so we can then compare the overall performance as we're increasing the number of virtual users and seeing the throughputs increase over time. Again, all completely unattended. So what we can see here is that MariaDB is giving us you know, very nice scalability. So we've got that near linear zone you know, where we're scaling the number of virtual users up to the number of CPUs and cores. Then we have an area where, don't forget, we have multiple sockets here. So we have the socket to socket scaling. Now, this is going to be very dependent on the hardware architecture and very dependent on the latency between server sockets. So this is very much something that you should do to get an overall insight into the capabilities of the server hardware you know, for running MariaDB. When we reach the higher point, that's very much the performance plateau. When we saw the executive summary, you know, this is where we're capturing that peak performance from. This is the point of the highest CPU utilization. And then beyond this point, we're starting to increase contention. So the overall throughput is starting to decline. So this is the way that you should compare different systems because different systems may show very different performance profiles. So this performance profile is really the key for gaining that analysis into overall hardware performance. We mentioned the response times as well, and HammerDB gives you a full response time report. So this is just the summary of the overall virtual users it actually gives you a breakdown for all of the individual virtual users as well. So this is captured at peak. So this is based on 68 virtual users. And this shows you the summary at the end taken from all of those individual reports. So what we can see here is that the performance of the different store procedures. So we can see the new order store procedures at top because that's our primary metric. 
we're going to capture the P95 response times and use that to draw the comparison into the overall customer experience. And of course, a lower response time, but also more consistent response times are, are going to give us better, better insights. And that's what this data gives us. So max, min, standard deviation, and the overall you know, ratio that these different store procedures are running in. So now let's take a quick look. We've looked at some of these insights and comparing hardware platforms and the cached workloads. Let's take a quick look at some of the advanced benchmarking techniques. So first of all, you know, if you want to stress cloud I.O. capabilities, as an example, there's a feature called use all warehouses. So we mentioned within the default workload that each virtual user will run 90 percent of its work on one individual warehouse. Well, use all warehouses, as it would suggest, then takes all of those warehouses that you've created. So for example, if you've created 100,000, it will then divide those warehouses up between the individual virtual users, and they will then select a new warehouse at each transaction. So hopefully that should give you the insight that now we're going to be doing a lot more IO to the data area because every transaction we're choosing a new warehouse, so there's a lot more potential that could be on cold data than rather than being already cached in memory as per the default workload. We also have a feature called you know, connect pooling for clusters. So if you want to test the cluster environment, this then gives you much more control over connecting one instance of HammerDB to multiple instances of a related database. So you can point, for example, the read-only transactions just to go to a read-only secondary endpoint within your cluster and direct the direct the read-write transactions to the primary. You can also define different policies, for example, have multiple connections and round robin between them. Because some databases won't necessarily give you the overall the, the overall TPM from the entire cluster, this, this functionality also reports out the client side view of the transactions per minute. There's also a feature called event-driven scaling that we mentioned before. This is based on coroutines. This is where we want either fixed throughput and we're going to create very high session counts now. So thousands and thousands of sessions, if you wish. So we create asynchronous clients per virtual users. And it manages the king and thinking time with these coroutines. So you're generating something much more closer to a full production workload that has many, many sessions. But for this, you want to be creating, for example, middleware, use multiple use multiple clients, you might want to have max scale. So again, this is much more in depth, moving more now towards the right of the, that benchmarking spectrum where you're, there's more complexity, but it's trying to give you more insights into something closer to a production workload if you're looking for this fixed throughput of very high session counts. Finally, for these advanced features, there's also, we mentioned testing scenarios where we're looking to simulate failures in the stack. If you want to vary the workload both up and down, HammerDB supports a primary and replica features so we can run multiple instances, define them to run at different points over the time. We very much have this pyramid type of workload where the work is varying. And we'll be using this really to measure the response times of the workload as the test is running, rather than looking at measuring the throughput, clearly because the workload is varying as we run it. So in terms of some next steps, you know, there's a number of published benchmarks. So if you go to the HammerDB Web, website, look under the benchmarks tab, you know, key question is, has somebody already done you know, some of the workloads I'm looking for insights for? And if you've done your workload, you know, can you publish it? You know, on a blog, you know, put the data on Twitter. You know, let's make database performance open and available, you know, to everyone so we can compare and contrast. You know, the more insights we share, you know, the more information is available for everybody to make the best decisions. Finally, you can contribute to our HammerDB on GitHub. 
you know, so all source code, you know, is GPL v3. So if you're looking to improve and enhance the MariaDB workload, you know, for HammerDB, then all the source code is right there. If you think you can improve the, the store procedures, you know, you've got insights in how you want to run different MariaDB workloads. Everything is there, open source and available for you to, to add and contribute and be able to give back to overall the database benchmarking community and make database benchmarking and make all the performance completely open source. At that point, I'll say thank you very much for listening. Okay, uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, much appreciate that talk. Um, it was a great talk on Hammond B benchmarking. So I want to actually first off just thank you for adding MariaDB support in HammerDB. I, um, I noticed you said that actually a while ago, but I didn't quite actually realize how how integrated you, you made it. So um, I'll just start up the questions with a, a quick thank you. Um, for first question, you were starting uh, your talk with talking about uh, differentiations and making sure when you do a benchmark, you, you know what objective you have. Um, so what do you normally see when people do this step wrong? I, that, that, that's a, a, a great question because I see this time and time again where people will just jump into benchmarking and start producing numbers, but then using it to make comparisons or insights that the numbers don't necessarily back up. So really, probably the, the biggest mistake is people not understanding the database engine, understanding how the database itself actually works, even understanding how a relational database works, <laughs> you know, understanding how you install and configure MariaDB correctly, understanding how you install the operating system, you know, setting up the, the CPU features such as Turbo Boost, you know, having the right disks, what you have configured for your redo log and your data area. You know, are you testing transactional workloads? Are you testing analytics? You know, those whole, it's really based on very much experience. And you see people, you know, with a lack of experience, really just jumping in, producing numbers, and then drawing insights that they don't really have, you know, either the, the background or the knowledge really to base those insights on. Mm, yeah. and, and then it gets more, doubly more complicated when they try to compare it to something else. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that, that's the, the big, big problem. There's so much that you need to, you know, there's, there's so much configuration you know, an, an expert, I always say, you know, an, an expert, you know, in any database will be able to produce, you know, by far, you know, the, the best numbers, you know, the best performance, but then it depends on what you're actually trying to, you know, configure, for example, in a production environment, that then that's where the real expertise coming it comes in to be able to generate those numbers, but then to be able to apply those appropriately to then produce the gains, because ultimately it's your production you know, implementation that, that that's exactly what what your where your key database is. So the benchmark numbers are very much a tool to help you improve that production environment. Right. Okay. Sure. So that covers about three questions I had. <laughs> um, so if we go back a little bit, um, how did the TPC Council get involved in HammerDB? Well, HammerDB has been around for you know a, a number of years, so it's always been you know an open source within Intel. You know, Intel supported open source projects right from the start, so it was very much a personal open source project that has grown. You know, always by always by customer demand, by user demand, so people wanting to run benchmarks on different databases you know, with di different configurations. So the TPC, you know, saw that HammerDB was, you know, most importantly is the TPC Open Source Council, so the TPC OSS subcommittee, and they were looking for an open source tool that had the widest support of databases, the most closely applied workloads, which are derived from the TPC-C and for transactional and TPC-H, 
for analytic. And so it was very much HammerDB that, that fitted the bill. So that's when HammerDB, you know, being open source, then moved under the umbrella of the TPC. Okay. Um, so you mentioned um, that on the the, the proc uh, CH is actually coming the TProc CH as a uh, a conglomerate of the C and the H analytics benchmarks. Um, how did that start to form into uh, a requirement? I say so again. That's been very much from sort of user demand, and I, I think that's probably the biggest shift that we're seeing within relational database workloads today. So traditionally, you know, we've had that you know, C for you know, transactional, you know, and the support for H for, for, for analytic. And they've been very much completely separate workloads, completely separate database instances. But customers are saying, you know, we're looking to run both transactional workloads and analytics together. So fortunately, we already have the, the CH specification. So that's already been written and some you know, sample workloads you know, have already been, been produced for that hybrid HTAP with your know, workload. So that the next step is really, and we already have the experience with HammerDB of the transactional analytic. So the next step is really just to work on producing that that hybrid, that CH specification, so then you'll have three options. You'll either have pure transactional, pure analytic, or that hybrid-based workload. And that's the, the real focus. That will be, the goal is for that to be in HammerDB version five. So the goal at least to start producing some of those, you know, next year when the development permits. Sure, it's just always a tough yeah. squeezing in development time, I know. Exactly. Um, uh, are there any other kind of um, benchmarks and standards that are, are being developed from user requirements? I mean, and that's the, I mean, again, that, that's a, the great question. I mean, the, there's always different, you know, areas, like, you know, workloads we could explore, always different, you know, suggestions. But, you know, at Anything the moment... I'm, to a general... Yeah, I mean, at least, but with you know the the, the CH that that's the key one. So that's mainly the you know the focus on you know next on on the horizon. But one thing about the the, the for example with transactional the TProc C workload or the TPC C workload, that's one that's very much stood the the test of time. You know, so that's always been the most widely used. It has that. It sort of fits very much on that benchmarking spectrum of something that will really drive the, the database and very much test the locking and latching, but it's not overly complex then that needs more time you know, and more expense to implement a very sort of wide range of specification. But also, most importantly, I think it's been proven to scale. You know, from when it was first introduced right now, you can still, the workload, you can implement that specification with HammerDB. And as long as your database engine and your hardware, you know, as that's increasing in performance all the time with Moore's Law scales, then the specification scales. And that's really, you know, part of the, mo the most key important part of an actual workload to ensure that it's able to test the capabilities of both the hardware and the software combined together. So yeah, what we have is still very, very much robust and you know, still very much appropriate for the hardware and software we have today. But yeah, so next CH is the next one on the horizon. You know, who knows what's coming after that, but we certainly have yeah. enough that you know, can really put demanding workloads on MariaDB today. Sure, okay. Um... So you mentioned some at, at the first question you that some tuning of MariaDB and the OS is kind of needed. Um, what what are the, if there was like a list of four or five things that are commonly missed in tuning? What would they be? I would say that the top one is always the the redo log. So when people run the the TProc C workload in the default environment. So that the default is very much CPU and memory intensive. So historically it was designed, you know, for, you know, so you could do CPU comparisons, you know, with, with a 
for a particular da- database workload. So the, by always that the top one that people miss is the redo log configuration. So when you're installing, you know, and configuring MariaDB, you know, for the first time, you're on the current version, you have the one, you know, redo log, you know, to be able to size that appropriately. So then you can actually get, because we're going to be driving a lot of throughput here, if you size. And then the next thing is very much is that, you know, the, the size of the buffer pool, you know, the buffer cache, how much memory, you know, how much memory you have available to actually cache the data. Because by default, we're going to have pretty much all the data as cached. So then all of the IO throughput will be going through the redo log. So by far the most common you know, error I see is you put the redo log you know, on maybe a slow you know, running hard drive, and then that becomes a, the biggest bottleneck. You know, so it, it's, it's very much you know, the, the basics of configuration, but that's also in understanding you know, the workload that you're running. So by understanding that's that, that default, it's CPU intensive, we're trying to get the fastest performance possible. It's and then beyond there, you, know, you have options yeah. such as you know, use all warehouses if you want to start adding in I.O. You know, throughput to the data area. But initially, it's that sizing memory, you know, redo log, and also make sure your OS is in, is tuned. So many people miss you know that aspect of the workload. Make sure your OS is in, is tuned for for CPUs. The most common thing I always see is people will have the CPUs set, for example, in power save mode, and they'll run the workload where you're throttling back the frequency deliberately to half of what the capability is. is. That's always a really common aspect with the, the OS tuning. So make sure that if you have Turbo Boost available, the CPUs are actually set to be able to use that. Okay. Uh, while we're talking about CPUs and frequencies, um, I noticed in your Ice Lake versus uh, uh, Cascade Lake comparison, the Ice Lake is actually a lower frequency um, core machine and it generates a faster throughput and it's only got slightly more cache on it. So uh, I think there's a, a very important lesson here on the comparison of hardware specs to benchmarks. Um, it's, it, it, exactly. I mean, that, that, that's a, a, great, a great insight. And it, it's the microarchitecture you know, differences that are producing the higher levels of throughput. So exactly, you can't take different generations of microarchitecture and then draw, you know, a generation to generation comparison, you know, just based on, on the frequencies or, or the turbo boost frequencies, because you have different, you know, aspects, you know, such as, you know, the, the IPC, you know, the instructions you know, per cycle that you're generating. And that, that involves much lower level sort of insights uh, looking at the CPU statistics where you can then actually see the differences in the levels of performance that you're getting. But then there's also the aspects of, you know, the, the scalability, you know, these, for those benchmarks, we're looking at two sockets. So that's very important, you know, to get those insights of how, you know, different CPU architectures may support different levels of scalability, you know, for, for MariaDB. So when you're comparing against, you know, different, different manufacturers, for example, of CPUs, you might see very, very different sc- levels of scalability, which will then translate into overall performance. So that's exactly the key reason why we do benchmarking. And then you can look at the statistics you know, available from the, the systems right down to that, that CPU level. And then that helps you gain the, the insights overall while we're pushing the database you know, for that aspect such as locking and latching those different instructions, they're going to be exercised, and then you can see the differences between the, the hardware that you're using. Okay, um, we're probably really short on the end of Q&A time, so if one final question for uh, 30 seconds or so, um, what sort of community contributions would you love to see to Hammond DB in the, in the next year or whenever? Uh, what I mean, we're getting so many you know, sort of you know, contributions at, at the moment. You know, in particular from from the you know the, the cloud vendors. So we've had some, for example, from AWS. You know, from Citus Data. You know, we, we're having so you know uh, 
wi a wide range of contributions overall. And it, I would just say that, yeah, the key aspects are really wherever somebody who uses a particular database, you know, such as, you know, such as MariaDB, what they want to see, you know, from the, the community. So, for example, if you're looking at, you know, on the, the TPROC H side for MariaDB, you know, with the analytics, you know, if you know how, for example, the column store works, you know, if you're looking at wide range of, you know, sort of like parallel queries, you know, that's exactly what we want to see. So very much, you know, a community you know, driven approach. What you want to see in the workload is very much what we want to see contributed because it's always been that level of, you know, demand, always that level of just sort of user demand that sets my time where to develop. But then, you know, my time is not necessarily able to cover absolutely everything. I always put in the top priorities. We want MariaDB. You know, that was the top priority to have that included. But now the option is to take that wherever the community wants to take it. Okay. Um, thank you, Steve. Much appreciate those additional questions and answers. Much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot.